I know several of you here, some of you I've just met for the first time, and it was suggested that I might tell you a little bit about myself um, and the firm as a way to introduce the topic of the facial house, and specifically what I want to talk about is this, this uh, I don't know if you have copies, but the, I brought one copy. the, it's essentially five years, but it's a five-year-plus approach to things that need to be done at the, at the face shield house. But first, let me give you a little bit of background information, both about myself, the firm, and, and the house and what's um, been done there over the years. Um, it seems like I've been doing this forever, because I have. And I'm sure that imprinting has something to do with it. I grew up on the east end of Galveston Island, which is the oldest part of town. It's a national landmark residential district, a wonderful Victorian neighborhood. I absolutely, absolutely loved it as a child growing up there. Loved walking to school or wherever else because I went by all these wonderful, everything from, excuse me, from small cottages to large houses and, and so forth. And it was, a, it was wonderful growing up there. Uh, when I went to college, I really didn't know any architects that I had uh, great admiration for, I'll have to put it that way. And I did other things before I went into the architecture program. But when I got into the architecture program, very early on, we had an all-school presentation by a professor who was involved in setting up a preservation program. Now, this was early. This was in the early 1970s. So that nationally, that was one of the earliest programs. In fact, Roy Graham, who many of you may know, Roy is the director of the preservation program at the University of Florida. He was one of the professors there at the university. And Roy was leaving. He left after the first year I was there. He went off to Williamsburg to be architect of Williamsburg. And the architect of Williamsburg came back to the University of Texas. Uh, that was Roy, um, Eugene George. He had been an architect there for the last several years, came back and started teaching. So I got to have contact with all those good folks. But I knew it was like the proverbial light bulb that somebody turned on. I knew when I heard that lecture that it was exactly what I wanted to be doing. I had no doubts about it. So the next several years, I finished up uh, my studies, formal studies, uh, focused specifically on historic architecture. Just very quickly, I uh, then went to work. This was uh, in um, 75, went to work at the, uh, the State Historic Preservation Office, just as every state has a State Historic Preservation Office. I was there for 11 years, the last five as the deputy director. And I was doing just dandy. Um, until I met my wife, and uh, here I have somebody in the same field. She had been uh, working in North Carolina with the state office and had been uh, hired to come to South Carolina. She was being groomed to be the next director there. The, the people, the, the director there was about to retire in a couple of years, so she had just come to that program. We were put on the same committee, and that was sort of ended it. And, uh, both of us had taken a long time to find each other. We were both uh, in our uh, mid to late 30s at that point. And so uh, I moved out to North Carolina exactly 25 years ago this year. One of my classmates in graduate school was Charles Phillips. And Charles had, where I had stayed in Texas, he had moved to Winston-Salem, had been the director of restoration at uh, Old Salem. And he then had been had teamed up with a fellow by the name of Paul Buchanan, who is the former director of restoration at uh, Colonial Williamsburg. He had been there 33 years, and he knew more about 18th century and early 19th century architecture than anybody alive. And Charles had said, why don't you come to work for us? And I thought, you know, this is a chance to learn uh, from Charles and from Paul, both people that hadn't really published a lot, but had a great deal of information. And so, that's what I did. I went out and uh, went into business with them, got married at the same time, did all the things you're not supposed to do at the same time, which is change cities, get married, and change careers. And so I went into the private practice, and um, you know, I've been there ever since. Um, in 1999, then, I accepted my own firm. Paul had died. Charles and I had sort of divergent interests. And um, the architectural firm doing very well, thank you. Uh, tell you about some of our current projects. We are currently working this, I guess, our eighth year working at the Hermitage, um, Andrew Jackson's home. By the way, he never liked to be called president. He said, it's General Jackson. He said, anybody can get elected president. Not everybody can lead men in battle. 
And I've always thought that was a great quote. Um, but we've been working at the Hermitage for many years. We're also working at, um, in Tennessee, we're working at the Blunt Mansion, which is the home of the first colonial, excuse me, not colonial, but provisional governor of uh, Tennessee. And you know, also in Tennessee, we're working on uh, Westwood, which is one of their great late 19th century houses that's been brought by a philanthropic group and given to Knox Heritage, which is the local preservation society. So the, the foundation hired us, bought this building, reverse order, bought the building, hired us, we're to do the master plan, we're in the process of doing the master plan, then we're converting the house to their, their offices, and uh, quite a wonderful project. Um, we're also um, working on Fort Sumter, preparing a master plan for Fort Sumter. We've worked on a whole series of lighthouses for the National Park Service and light facilities. Um, getting ready to, if you've ever been up uh, on Hatteras and been to Ocracoke Island, the only way you get there is by a ferry, and it's uh, we're getting ready to start on Ocracoke's uh, light station there, lighthouse and uh, other facilities. Um, we did the uh, old governor's mansion in Kentucky, the first one west of the Alleghenies, 1797, last year, President Washington's um, term as leader of the country. Um, we're doing eight slave quarters in Louisiana for the National Park Service, wonderful brick uh, slave quarters. Um, we are uh, doing work at Pinland, which is one of the great secrets if you don't know about Pinland. It's a school of the arts in the mountains of North Carolina, north of, of uh, Asheville. Um, we're doing a 1850s log house, double pin house, that had been in um, without a roof for about 30 years. And they asked us if we could save it. So not only can we save it, it's made of chestnut and it's just in great condition actually but we can convert it to faculty housing. So we're making it to two apartments for faculty. And it's turning out just wonderfully. And uh, one of their other buildings here, one of their, their earliest building, and also what's called Craft House, which is a three-story log building, which is our main facility. So we're having great fun with all of those. Uh, if any of you went to the University of North Carolina, which you probably wouldn't admit to if you did, uh, be in here. But uh, the, the two major buildings that form the quad on the campus are called Old East and Old West. Uh, parts of them date to the 1790s, and we recently completed a $6 million project to convert both of those to modern dormitory space. So we, we have a, a bunch of interesting projects that we've been working on, but not as interesting as the Minnesota Show House. This is a good one. Um, people ask me all the time about what makes a successful historic property. Um, a, a, a place of interest to the community or the larger community. And certainly I would say it's very important to have a good story. And you have not a good story. You have some great stories. It's not just one story. There's several stories associated with this property that is so compelling. There is the, the architecture angle of a Spanish colonial house, second colonial period, of the family that lived there. You have the uh, women's history angle of the, um, of the um, rooms, that, the lodging that was rented there. There is the growth of tourism. And you also don't sell short the role of the, the Danes in this. The Danes are the major property holder in the country of historic properties. I think it's 72 if I remember correctly. I've given this lecture about this house to a number of Danes before organizations. And I think that's right. I think it's 72. But the Danes, when they stepped in in 1939, really were doing things right. And you have all along. Um, you may remember that in the early 20th century at that time, that the house had evolved into different sort of uses so that there was uh, an art studio there and a, and a uh, poetry society we'd meet there periodically. The sorts of things, you know, you watch the artists and the artists go to the interesting places. Often it's the areas of town that are, have gotten a bit run down, but they're interesting visually and everything about them is, is a, a fascination. Um, but the Danes bought it in 39, acquired it, and they immediately went to the people that were doing this sort of work in the country at Williamsburg. And they brought in folks there to give them some advice on how to take care of the building, and how to deal with it. You later brought in Charlie Peterson. And Charlie Peterson 
is legendary. There's probably no single man, single person in this, excuse me, my apologies to you, single person in this country, didn't mean to leave out the women at all. There's no person in this country has had such an impact on a profession as that person, probably. He is the person that gave definition to historical architect. And if you ask me, I would say, I'm a historical architect. That's what my firm does. It's very different than new construction. What we do with historical architecture is, um, in one way, it's very much, it is above ground archaeology. It's above ground archaeology. We are going through a building to date the parts, just like archaeologists do with below grade investigations. You, we borrow two terms from uh, the realm of archaeology, two, two terms that they use. One is terminus post quam, and that says that no object can predate the technology that produced it. So when somebody tells me, this was my great great grandfather's watch, and I see this run by batteries, I know that can't be true because that battery has to be later than those century ago or whatever it was produced. The other law of archaeology is, is the law of superposition, which means whatever is on top had to come last. Regardless of the age of it, it had to come last. I'll give you one really good example. As we were working on this absolutely fabulous, the most important house in Charleston, Mild Bruton House. And the, this house has never been out of the family. It's been was built in 1785-89. Uh, it was the place that when the British captured Charleston, this is where they made their headquarters, the British commanding officer, Lord Cornwallis. At the end of the war, in, in Charleston, had no, no doubt about it, there was only one war. When the war ended in 1865, and they say it ended, we never surrendered, it ended. And that's true, Charleston never surrendered. But the Union troops, when they came, into town, the commanding officer made this his headquarters. So it's probably the only house in the country that's been the headquarters for two commanding armies, um, invading armies, they would say. But in that house, uh, we had come across layers of wallpaper, and we had dated them as to dating uh, 1805. And the specialist who reviewed the wallpaper said that couldn't be. That's really 1785 paper. You have that all wrong. Well, by the law of superposition, as we knew other changes had taken place, it may have been a 1785 wallpaper, but it wasn't put on until early into the 19th century. So that's one aspect of what we do. The other aspect that we do, and this is very important, both of these, in, in thinking about your property here, is very much like thinking of this being a patient. It's like a patient. The building, it's important to think of it as being what it is, which is an artifact. It is an artifact. It was produced in a different period by different construction techniques and different materials. And it's very appropriate, very important that when we take care of this patient, that we use the materials and techniques that are compatible so that we don't cause distress in the building. So those are the two things that we do that are very different than normal sort of architecture. And there's other aspects of it too that when we're in the, in the business of doing converting it to another use and so forth. In new design, you're thinking about a program and then you create the spaces. In the case of historic architecture, you already have the spaces and you're figuring out how to fit the program inside the spaces. It's the exact opposite. And as Charlie Peterson said many years ago, he said some architects just cannot do that. It's it's a very different way of looking at buildings. And I think that's very true. This building here, not only these very compelling stories to be told, and you're also benefiting from this wonderful large site that you have with a number of outbuildings and a lot of possibilities, but you also have some very significant challenges. The challenges are of this particular site, you have two streets that are very, very close. And it's not just the problem of the traffic, which you've had an incident very recently about. 
with the balcony being hit again, and it's happened a number of times, which should be a lesson to the city about this. But the other aspect of it is that the street, um, Cadiz Street, has a solid coating of street material, unlike on Aviles, which has dry laid brick and a sand bed. It's able to breathe. The moisture that's in the ground on Aviles can, can breathe, and we have a lot less moisture problems in the building on that side as opposed to Cadiz, where it's a solid coating and the water is um, guided towards the building. And so we have a seam, you'll always have a seam where you have different materials and you have water and the ground there. The nature of this whole region is that you have a very high water table. You don't go very deep at all and you will hit water. You have a, a very warm climate, you have a very humid climate, um, and you, of course, have a propensity for tropical disturbances, hurricanes, etc., all of those sorts of things. The professor I mentioned earlier about Eugene George, when he came back to the University of Texas, when he came back to, to, to uh, present, I wasn't in his class, but I went to it. I used to go to his class all the time, uh, his first year anyway. And in his very first day of class, he said to all the students, he said, the, the thing that I want you to remember, I want everybody to get out a piece of paper and write this down. If you're taking care of a building, there are three great threats. There are three great threats. And I want you to write this down in big letters, and if you don't remember anything else, you are to remember these things. The first great threat to a building is water. He waited for all of us to write it down. He said, the second great th threat to a building is water. And the third is water, and the fourth is way behind the third. He said, water, not only is presence in wetting and drying process, not only causes the deterioration of all materials, natural materials, but it creates the environment for all those things that attack older buildings too. All the plants, all the animals, all of those sorts of things. So your job as architect, if you're trying to build something that's going to last, then you get the water off the roof, you bring it to grade, you get it away from the building. And I don't know if you've ever read the books by Catherine Beischer. She's an architectural historian who's absolutely magnificent, has all sorts of write-ups up, write -ups in the New York Times and so forth. But she's a good friend of ours, and uh, she tells a story about um, many years ago, she was driving down the road and saw this wonderful old barn out in this field, and there were goats inside that had a new metal roof on top. And the building was in good shape. I think some of the goats that were inside with the hay and so forth. So she stopped, she climbed to this bob bar fence, had a tripod and cameras, and went and set up and was taking a picture. And she heard this very gruff voice said, What do you think you're doing? And she turned around, and there was this great big farmer in this big overalls. And so she told him she was taking photographs and so forth. And he said, So they sort of got into this dialogue, and she said, How wonderful that you got a roof on it to, to keep it intact, etc. And he said, well, the lady said, you know, if you, if you put a roof on it, your building will last forever. He said, "Why, if I took that off in just a few years, I could just sling a cat through the wall. <laughs> and I've always had images of slinging a cat through the wall. But, um, but the point is well taken. That, that's the great threat is, is dealing with water. And you certainly have that issue here. Um, we have the issue, and, and I'm going to get more detail in just a moment, but... Um, there are some things that we have control over and some things we don't have control over. Things that we would like the city to do, and, you'll, and I'll get to that in just a moment, is that we really need to, if at all possible, get a different paving material on the side street and a different sort of um, arrangement. And that's something they do have control over. It wouldn't alleviate completely your problems, but it would help it a good bit. The other thing that we really ought to be working with the city on is to have some restrictions on the size of the vehicles coming in on Avila Street. The, the hitting the balcony has been a reoccurring problem. There's a whole series of different earlier incidents, etc., etc., and that is the sort of thing that administratively could be handled. Now, as far as the problems here at the, at the house and what I've recommended, let me say this, that I have been an advocate since, since day one about 
getting together a plan of action that's multi-year so that you can plan for events. Um, I have, gee, I have a church in Charleston that I've been working with. I, I think this is the 21st year that I was brought in, made a 20-year plan for them that assessed the age of the parts, the condition of the parts, and if everything has a life cycle, and it does, then you can anticipate when things are going to wear out. And so I went through, and in that case, they have air conditioning systems, a lighting system, and everything else, but gave them a plan. This is the urgent things that you need to do right now. These are things that you should do within three years, within five years, within eight years, or ten years, and it, it'll come out differently on every project. Sometimes you can project 15 years, 20 years in the future. And it's the sort of thing that you want to come back about every five years and update it. It's what we've just been hired for the North Carolina Capitol, the old North Carolina Capitol, which is an 1841 building. It, it, is, it is one of the most important architecturally buildings in the country, public buildings in the country from the 19th century. No question about it. And it is the most important building in North Carolina. And I was approached about this about five years ago by folks at the state. There's a foundation that administers and takes care of the building, raises money for it. The state actually owns it, administers. The governor always has the office there, the, the press corps. The new modern Edward Rolstone 1970s building, they use that as their offices. But if anything important happens in North Carolina, they go two blocks away to the original Capitol building. And that's where they have their press conferences. That's where they have their major announcements. That's where they send their legislation, etc. It is a wonderful building. And they've always been in a reactive mode. Something comes up, the roof has gone bad, we need $800,000 for a roof. The air conditioning goes out, we need $300,000 for air conditioning. No, nobody planned for all this. So uh, folks that I know at the state and in the foundation contacted me and said, what would you do? What do you, what do you advise? How would you, how would you approach this management problem? How do, you, how do you come up with a solution for this management problem? And so I said, well, this is the sort of team of people that I would put together. Me, of course. And this kind of engineer, structural engineer, this kind of mechanical engineer that knows how to deal with a historic building and all the conditions that a historic building deals with, these kinds of material conservatives, because these are the conditions we have at this building. And uh, they said, congratulations, you've just been hired. And so, uh, well, that's great. So uh, we do have a contract now, and we're starting the first phase of this master plan, which we're doing much what we're doing here at this site. Um, in this case, we're starting the very first thing is doing a, a very careful recording process because we don't have any, we don't have, believe it or not, do not have a good set of accurate drawings and photographs comprehensively. So if this building burned tonight, we wouldn't be able to reproduce it or repair it as we would need to. So that's the very first thing we're doing. Then we're going through the process of the, the investigation, the documentation, all those sorts of things so we understand the history and the age of the parts. And then we'll go into the, the step of assessing a long-range plan of how to deal with repairs when the time comes to do it. When it comes to do the air conditioning and mechanical system for this building, which, in my opinion, could not come soon enough because the last time they did it, they put it on top of the roof and it's shaking all of the roof structure. We will have a place where to put it, and it would be able to function and won't cause damage. We know we'll, we'll have a plan to deal with the stonework, et cetera, et cetera, on the outside of the building, which is starting to fail in its natural cycle. We'll have a long-range plan, plan that will be 20, 25 years, and every five years we'll be doing an update to it. Here's the sort of things that we're dealing with here at the Venice Facial House. I described the sort of problems that you have. Water is always a key issue with this. But if you if you look at the building, you will see that there are spots of where the stucco on the outside is like it has a rash. You'll see a group, and they're in groups. Notice they're in groups. And if you look on the inside, the same sort of issues with the plaster work. Now, let me say something about stucco and plaster. Stucco generally refers to the outside Plaster refers to the inside. They're very, very similar chemically. There's, uh, there's a little bit of difference in the um, aggregate that you use for the interior plaster. And that's the main difference. But it's the same basic sort of material. And it's the right material to be used on this building here. Now, I want to back up just a little bit and, and talk about 
work that's been done. I mentioned about how the folks from Williamsburg came here and made all these recommendations back in the, in the, in the 40s, which was wonderful and very appropriate sort of advice. And then Charles Peterson came in at least in the 70s, Norman, is that? Early 70s. Early 70s. And Charles Peterson was legendary and great advice. And he, it was wonderful reading back over his reports and notes. He was doing the sorts of things of that period, which was the very best available as far as dating things and identifying things and all of those sorts of things. And one of the, one of the um, things he was doing was dating based upon the shingles that were uh, in the attic, which you can see where the L connects onto it. The original shingles are still some left up there in place. And so he has his whole set of um, conclusions from that. And then uh, Herschel Shepard and, uh, and Charles Phillips were later, by William Seal, I think was involved all along through all those years. And, um, and then in 2003, uh, William contacted me and said, there's some work that needs to take place at the Minnesota House. Um, how about uh, helping out there? And so we got involved. And um, the initial scope, there was grant money already here. Maybe all of you know this already. But there, was, there was grant money already set aside that had come in to do some work. And a lot of it had to do with somewhat, um, uh, there was a lot of painting and trim and, and a lot of things on the exterior to, to deal with. But when we got here and started to look at things more closely, and why uh, why paint was failing, why uh, what were the things that needed to be repaired, it was clear that that a number of the repairs that have been done, and this is not unusual, it's just um, this sort of thing happening. But when you go to um, a supply builder supply, it's very tough to find those kinds of line-based plasters and mortars, and even the typical things that were being recommended at the time, the best of sources, were a bit on the hard side, and they didn't transfer, let the transmission of moisture pass like the line-based things would be able to do. And so there have been a number of repairs that have been done, all very good ideas, very well-intentioned and so forth, but with, with that having been done, there was um, more water, because there's so much water here in this region that was trapped in the walls. And so what we found was is that, gee, um, we could paint this. We could go about painting all the exterior and interior, but we'd have the paint fail in very short order because we have so much moisture in the walls. The readings I was getting was a, a much higher amount than what you would ever want to see and much beyond the 21% the level that you have to, if you exceed that, you, then you're going to have all sorts of lichen and mosses and other sorts of things grow on. So we knew we had some issues. And so we began this process of instead sort of redirecting our effort to dealing with the stuccos and the plasters. And we went through this process. How do you do that when you're, you've got this material attached to very soft stone, cooking of stone? And, and so we went through this process of cutting, you may remember, cutting little small squares and chiseling those out. And the fellows really did a, a magnificent, fellows, I mean that men and women. There were men and women in the group, and they were doing a very good job of chiseling out these sections and removing it, and then put us in the position to be able to go back and put a, a lime-based uh, plaster on the inside, stuff on the outside, in, in order to let the moisture evaporate. Now, even at the very best of times with this location, this part of the world, this kind of construction, what you would have is that you have moisture, ground moisture, that's going to come up into the bottom part of the masonry, the, the, the stone walls. And it goes up, and if you walk along Kitty Street, you'll see a dark section about that high. That's moisture coming out from the ground, evaporating out. It means it's working. It means it's working. Is it unsightly to see that? Yes, but it's a very easy fix to make it unsightly. I'll get to that in just a moment. So, um, so uh, get, getting this plaster on the walls uh, and on the inside and stucco on the outside and, and getting that uh, so it's evaporating again um, is a critical aspect. But what then starts to show up is what you see in this sort of rash that you see in various locations are salts. And it's a variety of different kinds of salts. It's the salts that come from, so it doesn't all come from uh, groundwater, salt water, so forth. 
it, caused, it comes from the industrial sort of products that have been used in the previous plasters and mortars and all those sorts of things. So you have salts deposited with that. It's the moisture just in the air in that will cause that to bloom like it does. What's the process to so, for a solution for that? It, it's tricky. It is tricky, and it's, it's a process of applying, scraping off what's there, wetting the surface, and putting on a very absorptive clay. This is what conservators do. To, to remove salts from material. And you do it, and you do it multiple times. You do it, you let it sit overnight, you brush it off, you do it again and again and again to get the salts out of it. Is it harming anything? It's just harming the paint. It's harming the outer surface of the plaster or the stucco. It's not really causing any additional damage other than that unsightly characteristic. And we want to deal with that, of course. Now, what we have in terms of grant monies, um, and scheduled for the house now, you have two grants that have been approved. One is for this year right now, and that has already been authorized. And it has certain categories of work that are to be done. That's what the grant's for. And you never want to give grant money back. Never, ever, ever. So we want to make sure that we're being true to that. Within that, I have made some recommendations. And the recommendations um, are very much in line with what was um, initially outlined in the grant request, which is, yes, we need to deal with the kitchen building. If you walk around the kitchen building, you'll see that parts of the stucco on the outside were coming off. And we knew that we had there also a, a, a harder stucco than we'd like to have. So we knew we were going to have to be dealing with that. Um, but I will add, you will notice if you go over there today, that Conrad has gone by and made a little bit of investigation, and he's also found that inside the walls and in the joints, at some point, there were some metal rods that were inserted, and they're starting to, to um, rust, uh, oxidize also, and so those will need to be removed. That'll be one of those discoveries that just happens. You can bet we're probably going to have some rot associated with the wood framing members there as well. High priority, absolutely, dealing with those sorts of things. Other things. The thing I absolutely would recommend that we start this process of testing this removal of the salts. We want to try to get the salts that are in these pockets. And if you look at where they occur, they only occur at the first floor level. They only occur at the first floor level. That matches up with what we found when we took off the hard stucco and plaster previously. It was only at the first floor level. The water would start to go up the walls. Plaster would be put on, it'd go up higher, it couldn't breathe, higher, higher. That's what caused so much of the wood framing to rot around the first floor, doors and windows and so forth, but it wasn't doing it at the second floor. So we don't have the same problems with the second level. We only have it at the first level. Where we have these pockets of salt, we want to try to get that off of there so we can minimize the sort of um, blooming and deterioration that we would have um, if we started going back, putting on new plaster, putting on new lime washes and paints and so forth. So we would definitely want to do that. There's a phase, there's, there's a uh, section in there also dealing with start to replastering, and I think that's fine as long as we do it up on the second floor. So we can do those sorts of replastering on the inside, on the second floor, start getting that taken care of. We have some issues with, the, something we did not get to in the last phase was in the dormers, the, those little windows that are on the roof. There's seven dormers. All of them have pretty modern, they are, uh, modern window sash in them. And they're not, those sash just are not holding up very well. The, the wood that's in there is just not holding up. So they're going to they're gonna need to repair, maybe even replacement. So there's that aspect. And here's another thing that, I, that we're uh, including in this also. You may remember that Frank Welsh, has a couple of times made some investigations, performed some paint analysis at the house. The first time, I think, it was 1979. And he, with the dames, going through, selected different portions of the house and performed paint analysis. And it was primarily focused on the very earliest period. And of course, the house really represents a couple of different periods the very earliest, 17. 90s construction, and then later 19th century construction in, in the L portion. 
So he was he was sporadically sort of hitting different areas. And then the second time he did work there is when we were working on the plasters on the interior and stucco on the exterior, and we were going to have to take off so much was mixed in with the with the harder uh, based uh, material that I didn't want to lose any of the evidence. I remember thinking about this as an artifact that has information just like an archaeological site. We brought Frank in to to look at these different paints that were showing up on the, on the stucco, for example, and the plaster on the inside. I wanted to make sure that we weren't losing any important early information. And I also wanted him to look to see if we might have wallpapers. It's one of those things that we don't think about too much in just commonly, is how typical wallpapers were in the early 19th century. It was, they were all over the place, far more than we realized. And it's also the sort of thing that's easily removed, but it le when you go to pull it off, when I say guys, I mean men and women, when guys pull it off, they leave little fragments in certain locations, on top of doors, for example, this piece here. Nobody ever sees that, so when a guy pulls it off, they don't really bother. To, all ethnic groups, all periods in time, they do that. Nobody ever sees it, so they just leave it up there. So that's a good place to look for wallpaper fragments. So I wanted Frank to go through and look to see if he could find wallpaper fragments or if he could find glue on layers of the plasters so we know that we need we have wallpapers. And, and he came to the conclusion there was no evidence whatsoever wow. anywhere for any kind of wallpapers in, in, in the early periods of the house. So that was the conclusion there. But we wanted to get that done. Now, there's, in, in this little summary that I prepared here, I say there's, there's, several, there's several threats. Uh, one of the threats is, of course, the, the vehicles here on the, so close to the street. Mm -hmm. One uh, threat is from the salts that are uh, deteriorating. Um, um, and one th threat is a false sense of security. A sense of security of having had some really good research prepared, thinking you know all that you need to know about the house. And that's just not the case. And it'll, ne it'll never quite be the case. What I suggest at this phase is that we really ought to bring Frank back in. He has sporadically checked a number of things. We really ought to get a more comprehensive picture of what we have in the way of finishes on the building. If you will go over into the dining room, and this was something that Frank alluded to back in 1979, that when he was doing his first testing, he was identifying the finishes. He said, I'm getting a glazing on two of the doors that look like the glazing that you would have for a mahogany or a walnut faux finish. It means a decorative finish where you would paint a graining pattern on a very durable but not decorative wood and give that false sort of appearance to it. Very nice thing to come across. And just a few years ago when Conrad was doing some cleaning and testing on one of the doors. He tested on the door, and lo and behold, there's a very handsome graining pattern on the door leading into the dining room. That tells me that we probably have other things going on, too, and we need to be very, very careful. That would be quite, that is quite a fine, and we need to be careful how we proceed. We don't want to be adding more layers of paint. We want to know what we've got going on. So my recommendation, in addition to working on the kitchen, working, removing the salts, putting the plaster, repairing the dormer system, is to take a phase and have Frank pull together other missing parts of the, the testing so that we have a better idea what we might have there. We do or we don't. If we have decorative graining on that parlor, you might very well have it upstairs, and you might very well have some sort of a decorative pattern on something like a mantelpiece, for example. The thing to do is to try to find these things out. And, and I would suggest we do it this year and get that behind us, get that, that knowledge base together. Now, that's the first year. The second year, you have a grant approved, but it hasn't yet been authorized. I just want to mention we have funding within the first grant to do this paint analysis because the funding I had written in to hire an architect with we were able to use another grant to pay him. So he's already paid. So we already have the money to use an expert, which is why we thought it would be good to get him. 
there's there's one other thing in the first phase that's beyond the grant this first year. Uh, back to the water issue. In the last X number of months here, there's been multiple leaks springing up with the roof. And Conrad got up there yesterday and did some emergency patching. And if you look at the there's a look at the roof, there's a number of issues that are going on there. And it's something I know it's only been 10 years or so since it's been replaced. But if you think about it, that's the, the major protective cover from rainfall. And you can look out there and see that there's a number of shingles that are missing. There's a number of shingles that are warped. There's funny things going on at the caps. Um, it, I do not see any flashing at the chimneys. The flashing is a material that fits under the shingles, up into the chimney that you want to be shedding water. The leaks that have been happening have been around the ridges where two planes come together and at the chimneys. And um, that's, um, you know, every, t here's my warning about roofs. Um, when things start to leak, it's usually a long time before you know it. It's getting wet, and, it, and it, it's the sort of thing that doesn't happen every time it rains. It's when there's a certain direction, certain wind blowing with it, etc. It's when you'll have certain places of your roof that will leak. It's usually after it's been leaking for a long time before it starts to surface somewhere that you know about it, and often you've had a bunch of damage by that point. So if you start having a problem with the roof, you want to try to get it corrected, get it corrected earlier so you don't incur these additional costs, etc. So the roof is a high priority, in my opinion, um, and um, I would try to schedule it as soon as possible. I did not want to interfere with the first two years because those are grant funds that have already been allocated and approved, and, um, and we try to work with, within that. But that is a matter of concern, and, and the, the temporary repairs have been made now that should alleviate the majority of the, the leaking that's occurred. The second year, based upon what we find with the decorative finishes the very first year, and I don't know what that's going to be. I don't know what things we're going to find. But it may be that, ideally, whatever we do find in the decorative finishes, I'd like to have somebody test the removal process and what we can do to uncover. And I am not suggesting for a moment, and I think this is one of the pitfalls that museums often come, follow, find themselves in, is thinking we have to produce a product. We have to produce this finished product, and that's what people want to see. What I think you'll find instead is that people really love to see the process. We really love to see the process. And, and this is something we learned um, many years ago when I first moved out here. Charles and Paul were working on the White House of the Confederacy and, and the Wickham Valentine Museum in, in Richmond. And so while we were working there, the museum said, we really need to keep the tourists coming through this building because that's our livelihood. And so would y'all mind working why people come through? Well, when people would come through, they invariably said, well, what, what are you, why are you taking up the floor? Why are you doing that? Why are you opening up the chip? What do you see there? And so we would invariably give them a little spiel about it. What they found was that their visitation went way up because people like to see that. They'd rather see that than go see a finished product. And they liked seeing what, you, what else you've been covered. So they liked coming back and see. It was like having a new exhibit, you know, something else happening. We sort of told that story a number of times. That's exactly what Poplar Forest is doing. Travis McDonald, who's the director of restoration at Poplar Forest, was the uh, director at the White House of the Confederacy. No, excuse me, at the Wickham, Val Wickham Valentine House. And he took that same idea to, the, to, the, to the Poplar Forest, and that's exactly what they do. They, their whole presentation is showing this change, this process of discovery, and how you implement this. So I'm not suggesting that you go in and you strip everything down and show whatever. But I suggest that you do little vignettes, find out the best way to do that, decide how you're going to handle different things, all sorts of ways to handle your interpretation. But I would, the important thing for you to do is know what you have.
You want to know what you have. That's, that's the critical thing. And, and what a wonderful new dimension to add to the whole process of interpretation. I don't know of another building in St. Augustine that has decorative faux finishes. But that's, that's certainly a very good calling card as well. Okay, so that's one aspect of year number two. The other aspect is, let's, based upon what we can do in the first year of removing salts, let's try to, gosh, I'd love to wrap it all up in the first year, but if we have more to do, let's continue doing that and try to uh, alleviate that as well. And then we can go to other rooms and other places on the inside and remove more extensively, replace with the plaster that's out, that's uh, damaged from the bloom 